to our Lunch and Learn today. We're here to talk about how we can invest in those that we work with, whether or not we're in a leadership position, whether or not we are of having the title of I am a leader, or we're just working within our company. This is about how we can invest with those that we work with and really why that is so important. Why should we even consider that? Why is that something that should be on the top of our minds? I've got an incredible guest with us today, Lewis Carter. Lewis is an executive coach and strategic advisor to Fortune 500 companies and the likes of the Pentagon and the U.S. Department of Justice. He helps leaders produce their best results. He is the CEO of the Best Practice Institute, author of In Great Company, and has a podcast on executive coaching and leadership and development. Lewis, thanks for being here. Gary, yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. So I would love to get started. How did you get into this work? I know that you're motivated about just why people connect with each other. Why is it so focused about being our best selves when we're around those that we work with? How did you get involved this, in this type of work? What got you started thinking about why is this is important? Well, I, I came from the investment banking and um, management consulting world, and uh, it was back in the 90s. And at that time, things weren't that nice. People weren't that nice to each other in the 90s or 80s, really. Uh, it was not that you had to be nice in business. Uh, it just didn't seem like the right thing for me at that time. And did well, I enjoyed it. I did what I needed to do at that time. And at the same time, I found a love of, of developing leaders and really how it connects to strategy inside of companies and ultimately the bottom line. That's really the key. So I found that I could find out, I could measure the impact of a company and how well it does in the market based upon organizational culture and the decisions that leaders make within it. And we created assessments. I uh, worked with some of the founders of the field back in the 90s, like Warren Bennis, and actually created a model on it, the very first book called Best Practices in Leadership Development, and doing just what you said before, which is deciding how a company should invest in their leaders from companies like Motorola, General Electric, a large Fortune 500s, Johnson & Johnson, and discovering how much they do invest in leaders and why they invest in leaders. That's so fascinating. That's a very interesting beginning. I know I've got a lot of friends who work in investment banking or have worked in investment banking. And the common theme I think I hear of all of them is the bragging of how many hours they worked that week. Um, whether we're talking about 80 hours, 90, 100. And um, it doesn't seem healthy. It never, ever seems to be healthy. No one's ever talking about how much they're enjoying their jobs, but it's more or less uh, almost like how much who, who struggled the most that week. And um, it doesn't seem like a conducive way to build culture or build people up um, because they're not necessarily the most fond of their businesses. And I mean, I would imagine that it's potentially gotten better since the 80s and 90s, but still this is what I'm hearing from, from those I'm friends with that are working in investment banking. What was, what, I guess I love, do you have a specific story of something that happened that just was like the click moment where you're like, whoa, this is not all right. This is where it needs to, this is where the change needs to happen. If you, if you do, could you share that story? There's a couple of them um, I could share with you. Um, I, I, I do want to say though that um, the, the time that I invest in my, in my work um, in life is, is similar. Um, the, the difference that I have in uh, the enjoyment factor and happiness factor, though, is, is different. So similar amount of hours, different in happiness factor. So um, I started my first job uh, out of college at a management consulting firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Boston. It's a big company. So uh, it was all Harvard people. I was the only one from, who wasn't from Harvard. So I worked pretty much all night and, and, uh, for this company to finish a deliverable that they had, and they wanted me to finish. They all left and they went to a party that night. And uh, this is when you start, I started my career, you know, when you're young and you're, you know, ready to go and things are good, you know. They left, they went to a party <laughs> together. And I, I, I was done at like two o'clock in the morning after working. And I went downstairs and to, to leave. And uh, the door was locked, the alarm was on, and I was without code or key. And I remember vividly where I was because if I, opened it up, the police would have come. Um, and it, even if I jimmied the lock a little bit. So uh, I called up the, uh, the, uh, the, the owner and said, hey, Randy, I'd say his name. Uh, I'm here. I'm locked in the office. 
So behind him was this loud music playing. He was totally drunk and he was with all the rest of the, the colleagues there. And I, and I said, that was it. I, I, I decided I will never work in an environment like that again. Um, they had treated me horribly anyway because I was in, I was not included in their Harvard club. I was from another Ivy. They hated. Uh, <laughs> they just hated it. So, uh, and they actually took it out on me. I was excluded in their club. It doesn't work out quite that way. I really recommend that people love their CEO first. Um, they have to jive with that CEO. You have to know who that is. You have to want to work for that CEO. You have to work want to work with your colleagues. You have to not just love. Um, this kind of concept of working, you have to love the company, um, especially now we're in global di di dispersed workforces, more remote or hybrid situations now more than ever, we have to really love that company. And I walked into that uh, in Renee's office that next day um, and he, he actually had the door closed. I, after I walked in, he, he closed, he said, sit there and wait. And I sat there for two hours I said, and I went in there and I said, look, I just waited two hours. You've been treating me horribly for the past four months. I quit. And I remember how great that felt, that kind of, oh, it's the first time I ever, you know, really told somebody the way I, I saw it, I called it, right? And I think we all need to do that more when we feel like we just don't belong or we're excluded or, you know, there, sometimes there just is not a way in, right? You have to know about when there's not a way in, you need to find a way out. Yeah. That's for so many people. I'd be curious, and not to play devil's advocate, but do you think that they were consciously aware that because you weren't a Harvard person or an Ivy League person that they, or because you weren't a Harvard person that they specifically singled you out? Do you think that was a conscious decision on their part? Or do you think it was unconscious and they just more or less gelled together because they, it was like, it was normal to gel together? What are your thoughts on that? It's a joke, you know, I, definitely the Harvard joke versus going to Brown or Columbia, you know, the shoreline. It's, it's a joke. Um, whether it's unconscious or not, I don't know. You have to ask them. Um, as a young kid out of college, though, you know, bright eyed, you know, bushy, you know, it, it doesn't work. Um, if I'd gone in today, it would have been a different situation altogether with every single one of them. Uh, knowing what I know now, uh, they would not be acting that way. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is back in 96, you know, and now it's 2020, right? And I've amassed a lot of knowledge about working with people and i would never take that kind of disrespect and respect is one of my parts of my book and i talk about how brigadier general who i model in this book we model in this book tom polis and how he formed respect inside of his uh, korean augmentee and u.s soldier unit and that became the model for our the respect part of, of the book because without respect nothing happens and each and every one of those people today would get far different treatment than the 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 uh, the whatever year old I was in 1996, Lou, uh, Lou's different today, very different. Well, I'd be curious, how would you treat, how would you handle a situation like that? If you felt like you were being either discriminated against or singled out in any form or fashion, how do you handle that in a way? Because I, I would imagine though, the way that you handled that situation, I bet it felt great in the moment, but potentially was slightly risky because if you were to list that person as a reference, it would be kind of tough. You'd be like, this guy walked out on me. He said he quit. You know, it might be a difficult circumstance to kind of handle. Um, yeah, I'd be curious, is, would you have potentially done it differently now that you've kind of formulated your thoughts around this? Or is there a more potentially way to do it with leaving a little more respect uh, while walking out the door? But are there other ways to go about getting people to respect you more in general or communicate that you'd like to be respected more if you feel like you're being singled out? I think it has a lot to do with gaining an understanding of who you are first. And really, once you have that understanding, reflecting on who you really are and who you want to be, right? So we have something called a positive future vision grid that we have in my book. And it looks at things about ourselves that we don't want to be, right? And things that we want to be, want to become. And it probably took me a good amount of time, did take me a good amount of time to realize the who I want to be and who I am. And that was not me. It was not me. So I, I didn't belong inside of a company with other people even. <laughs> I was an entrepreneur. I, meant, I was meant to be with other entrepreneurs, other high growth people, people who thought of growth, people thought of uh, you know, how to become better and more effective, a better leader. 
um, that's where I belong and that's where I moved to. Um, I didn't belong there, literally didn't belong there. And the way to deal with them would be, first of all, to find those, those, uh, those triggers, my triggers, personal triggers. And I still have, I still have those triggers um, in the beginning and say, these are triggers that I don't work well with. I will not be effectively committed, feeling like I want to be committed to this company um, once things keep going, because there's no way that this environment is conducive to me. So you know, they were more group. Uh, if you look at the system, it was more group specific. So there was groups of people who had one thinking, they called synchronous thinking, David Kander's organizational systems theory is synchronous thinking, right? Versus when I moved to this awesome company called Linkage, we were more random and cool and like, uh, thought about ways to build businesses. And we had new P&Ls each year and we inv- innovated neat things. That's more random and, and open. And I'm more of a random open individual. So it never would have happened. Never would have happened. I, wouldn't, I would have run from that situation. I wouldn't even have looked at it or considered that as a possibility for my, for, for my, uh, my employment. That's interesting. That's fascinating. I think a lot of people, when they are perhaps younger in their career or when they are perhaps still figuring themselves out, they try to potentially fit themselves into a box that isn't necessarily them, but they don't actually know what is them. They're going with what is respectable, what is perceptively the right thing to do and not necessarily the right thing for them. Um, so I totally see where you're going with that. But one thing you talked about earlier that I really, I would love to extrapolate on a little bit more because I think there's a, I, I think there's a bigger impact is you mentioned you really, you really have to like your CEO. And I think that could probably be extrapolated to, you really have to like your manager. I mean, whether a, they're a mid-level manager or a senior manager or somebody in the C-suite, wherever they're at in the company, you have to really like that person. You have to really respect them because if you don't, you're not going to stay long. You're not going to jive with them. And that's not going to be conducive to building a stronger bond and having retention, which by the way means that if you are a senior leader within your company and you've got people that are managing people that are reporting to you, so maybe there's a layer between you and the, the people who are actually doing the work, maybe on the ground floor of the company and, and actually pursuing this work, um, you have to be able to not only be the person that, the people that report to you really like, but also get them to be people that are likable as well. Is that correct? Is that kind of where you're going with that, Lewis? As a CEO, I, I don't think you need to change. <laughs> and I've had this, uh, this sure. talk with CEOs a lot. Um, I find what I always find is important is that you find your strengths and there's a lot of noise around your strengths, a lot of noise. And there are little things that you need to look out for that you have to change little things. So these, and, and, and you have to find out how to, how to adjust them. It's like sailing and you, you take in that sheet a little bit, right? And you look at the strengths and then you, you double down, triple down, quadruple down on those strengths and you win through them. You have success through them. There, there's nothing like great success to be effective. Nothing. When you're down, people will kick you. They'll kick you when you're down. When you're successful, they'll all come on, on your ship. Everybody. So, it's more important that the CEO is themselves and others who come on are important, are, are important enough to themselves, right? To be honest, because you come in under false pretenses. You think you're signing on to a different company than who you are. You're not going to stay. So I, what I, I, I'm talking to your CEOs now, right? You can find, I'm not, I'm not telling you to go become, if you, become the people that you're trying to recruit. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I recommend you be yourself and, it, and your company become loved, okay? So if you want to be loved, be yourself. If, if you are somebody who others see as cantankerous or rude or annoying, well, it, maybe you are, <laughs> okay? And that's okay. There's people who can jive with you like that. There are, in fact, most CEOs have around a 40 to 50% uh, rate of approval. There are 60% of people most of the time who don't like you. Now, if you're great at strategic thinking 
and you create and you just brought the company into hockey stick growth and there might be a couple things that you need to change what's the cost of changing those things versus the benefit you have to decide that because if you're constantly bending and being malleable to the needs and wants and demands of your of of your people's psychological safety requirements you'll never keep sailing <laughs> You won't go forward. You go backward. So move forward with small adjustments and stay in your strengths, win, and then others will follow who are the right people to follow you. What about your example before with the investment banking? Like where was that? Where did that CEO go wrong? And, or rather, maybe what, are you almost kind of suggesting that it was perhaps a little bit on you to kind of not recognize, okay, this CEO is being himself and he's just not a nice guy. He's just a jerk. <laughs> Well, it went, that, was a, that was a consulting firm I worked for. The one before then, I didn't even know the CEO. I was okay. at all. You know, it, 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 was, it was the culture at that place. It, that was a different situation. So there's CEO, then there's culture, right? So, you know, I don't blame it on Randy, it's, who was the CEO at that time. In fact, he had a culture that was very strong for the people he, le- he led. It's just I wasn't part of it, right? I was not part of it. And now I look back and I say, I just wasn't part of it. And I was kind of young enough to not know it. I was too young. I was too young not to know it. I was too green to not know it, right? I mean, you see, like, there's a difference between just being young and knowing yourself. I didn't know myself. I know I didn't. And then before then, I didn't know myself in in a culture. (laughs) So I I didn't know how I fit in, and I wouldn't have been able to. Now, then after that, I found a culture that was me. It was open. It was random. Because it's more like jazz, right? It was open and random. It was more what I jive with, right? Because I think that's the most important part of what everyone does is we blame others because they're not like us, right? Rather than saying, this is who I am. This is where I do belong. And this is my affinity group. This is where I most can feel like I'm myself. And you really have to seek that out and be in that place because what happens is at a company, we did research on this, when, when there's, let's say, there, out of 10 people, right, it, 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 when, when there's a situation where employees hate their workplace and there's disrespect happening, only two of those 10 people were, will leave, right? Because they, they, when they feel out of it, those two people are functional. They get it. They get to that awareness, self-awareness, those other eight stay and they make everybody's life a living hell. They ruin the whole culture and they have something called normative or continuous commitment means I can't go anywhere else because I need a job. So you have low productivity and you have people who just make make it less less of a happy environment And, and nobody wins then. You know, and this, that's why CEOs ask constantly, please cut these 20, cut these 30. <laughs> They're people who shouldn't be there. They should not be there. They're in the wrong place, wrong culture. There's other places that are correct. And just because there's no jobs out there doesn't mean you should be miserable. That's a great point. Now, that's a really interesting insight. It's an interesting perspective. Um, which leads to the main point of this topic is why is it important to invest in people? Even if we're not in a leadership position, why is it important to invest in those people that we work with? Why is it important to invest in those relationships and really double down on those strengths, the ones that are really jiving and working well with us? Back in 98, there was the average investments in senior executives was between 18000 and $25,000. Now, back now in 2020, we have... Of, we have even more being invested into senior executives, around sixty to ninety thousand per per year. And this is top C suite, CEO suite. It's between one hundred fifty and three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Now, if you go down into the management, into VP management, even lower in line level, it's between twenty five hundred and five thousand around that. So uh, now. What, what typically is part of that is, is a coaching arrangement, is a behavioral change. Um, and then when you're really advanced um, and you do what we recommend, we connect it to um, achievement. 
And the achievement is really about results. So um, investment in, in people is number one, you have to discover first the culture. Is, is, it, is it what you think it is? Are those right people in, the, in those positions? Or are they miserable? Because we found in some situations, we found it's a large global manufacturing company. And we looked in MENA, Middle East, North Africa, EMEA, um, APAC, and, and, and in the North America. And we found out that throughout every, all around the globe, people were le- leaving on year two because they had really low scores and positive vision for the future. So they're feeling really horrible about their life at this company. And when they feel horrible at their life, you have to find who they are, um, not cut them, <laughs> discover though where they're moving and what their true selves are. And if they have an agility, are they agile enough to develop and move to a different level? If not, we have to help them to not just find a job, but help them to discover who they truly are. And that's really what this is about is you have to really, you have to get to a point where when you develop others, you're helping them develop in their groups, developing themselves, develop working with others, and then developing within inside the organization. Because every single day, there's really two simple things that happen. You want to know the two simple things? It's very easy. And everybody makes it really complicated. It's what and how. It's not why. It's what and how. Okay, our why is there We for family or reason that it's a drill company isn't necessarily because they make drill Brits is to put beautiful pictures of their family up in the wall. For individuals who are inside of a system, though, they need a what and a, they need a what and a how. Here's my what. How do you do it? Now, let's follow up and see how you do it, right? So this here today, we do a video and what's going to happen has to be cut up, has to be, has, there has to be things that go in the front that says that has specific uh, information and has to be brought throughout social media given to your CEOs and they have to explore it, connect with it. You have to find the most salient elements. There's a lot to that, right? There's a lot to the how. There's a simple what there though. What am I doing? Making a video for your CEO uh, uh, members, right? That's what, go make a video for my CEO members. And now it needs to be the how. So CEOs, when you develop people, what you're really doing is you're giving them a what so they can give you a how. Because you don't want them just being go-doers, you want them to be go-toers, okay? So when you go to someone, you say, this is what I need. I need this to happen. And they say, yep. I get that. This is how I'm going to do it. Then you say, I see that. I appreciate that. Here's some advice on that. When's that going to happen? 10 10 days, 20 days. Great. Let's check in. Let's have check-ins, feed forward moments, actionable moments, right? That's true development. That's true development. Actionable moments where you listen to their hows and you help them to, to mold their hows right? Molding how they do it. What, you know, and your what is there. It's your vision. It's your positive vision for the future. So development is really something that should happen. It shouldn't just happen to somebody. You see? It's, yeah, no, that makes sense. So I'd, what I'd be curious to know is for those of us that are not necessarily in perhaps a leadership role within our companies, but we're interested in investing time in these relationships, are there things that we, what are some things that we can do to be more intentionally focused about investing that time into building those relationships with those that we work with? Time is precious. We give away energy. We give away our time. It's precious. Uh, and, you know, we could be doing something else. We could rest in our minds. We could be developing our minds, right? We could be reading. Uh, we could be preparing for something else, right? It could be, there's numerous things that could happen in our time. So we have to figure out, like, first of all, number one, uh, CEOs today need, and I know you know this, if you're CEOs out there, you know I'm talking to you. If I'm saying this, I bet you've been outside of your company or had to get or walk away from your company a lot this year, okay? Had to walk away, go on vacation, take, take a walk, go play golf, do one of your things that feels good to you. Just get away because I will bet and I know you know what I'm talking about here, that at some moment during your day, 
or that you don't or shouldn't be seen because you're angry, you're upset, you're tired, there's some trigger, and you want, when, when you're on, you're on. It's showtime. And if you go out in front of everybody inside your company and they see you like that, it's not going to work. So I bet, I'm going to guess, the great ones in the audience right now, you know what you're talking about. It's okay to walk away. Give yourself permission. And I know you have. Just make sure that you do, that you do it. I don't care what it is. If you hunt, if you, if you water ski, if you need to go golf, um, you play drums, do what you love. Please find those things that you love because it detaches you so you can reattach back into the system and be at your very best. That makes sense. And I think that can be beneficial. So, um, but back, back to the question of how can we go about investing in our people? So I think when, when I think you gave great insight, if let's say we're at a position where we are just having a rough day or we're just not on our A game, um, no matter where we're at in the company, if we're just not at our best selves, take a moment to step away because that's going to be better for everybody that's around us. But when we are ready, we are mentally in a state that's conducive for investing in our people time and building them up. What can we do? I think really the question I'm asking is sometimes I feel like as professionals, we can go in as leaders, we can go through our day to day of, you know, this is what we need to do. This is what I got on the calendar. This is what needs to get done. Task one, task two, this is what's going on. Um, and I know in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, I should be more intentional about just investing time and energy into the people I work with. I, you know, I know it like on a periphery, it's important that I should do it. But if it's not on my daily routine calendar, it just doesn't get done. What can we do, even if it's a small daily routine, what can we do to start being more intentional about our focus on investing in the people we work with? Best thing you can do, if I'm talking to your CEOs here, this is what I think you should do every single day, and I recommend this, which is to ask, how can I do better? So there's real, really three different questions I say to everybody. You, you say every moment you have, you, you, anytime you, you, you're able to talk to employees, say, what am I doing well? What can I do better? What should I stop, start, or do more or less of? That information that you are getting from them is invaluable. You can decide whether or not you want to do certain things. You can decide the cost and benefit of those things. It gives you an opportunity, though, to be open to what they are doing and what they're going through. Getting intelligence on what others are doing is super important so that you're understanding the real culture of the company. So in terms of developing others, um, that actually is the, the start to developing others, is getting people and introducing this practice into daily discipline so that everybody can be in this culture of continuous improvement, of continuous leadership effectiveness, and they can discover the goals and leadership behaviors that they most need to flex and, to, and become even better at. Yeah, that's awesome. That makes a ton of sense. Um, well, Lewis, this has been a really valuable, very interesting, very insightful lunch and learn. Um, my last question is, how can our audience learn more about you? You just go, go to lewiscarter.com. There's a book called In Great Company I just wrote. I wrote a lot of other, I wrote about 11 others that are uh, on, on change champions, uh, talent management. But, uh, but Lewis, and lewiscarter.com is uh is where you can get everything um i'm also ceo of best practice institute i also have another company called most love workplace which is um becoming a loved workplace and uh you check that out as well that's awesome lewis thanks for being here this was awesome you're welcome you're welcome Garrett. my pleasure uh Thank <laughs> you.